Okay, well, I think we'll get started. There may be some more folks trickling in. So welcome, hello, my name is Deborah Barkin and I'm the creative director at the Berman Museum of Art at Ursinus College. And I'm pleased to welcome you to tonight's Berman Conversation organized in conjunction with our fall 2021 exhibition, Allison Safford Anthracite. And this is our last public event of the season. So thank you for coming by tonight. Toward the end of the hour, we will have a question and answer period. In the meantime, please type your questions into the chat if you'd like, and please mute your microphone for optimal sound quality. So I'm delighted to introduce our speakers this evening, Allison Safford and Carrie Freno. Allison Safford received a BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and an MFA from Alfred University. Safford is a teaching artist and has taught at Bowling Green State University, Hampshire College, and most recently at the Cambridge School of Weston. In 2013, she was awarded a residency at Sunday morning at EKWC in Den Bosch, Netherlands. She has been in residence at the Vermont Studio Center, at Sculpture Space, at the Bubeck Sculpture Studio in Prague, Czech Republic, as well as residencies in Wiesp, Netherlands, Kauna, Lithuania, and Slovakia. She has presented artist talks at the Everson Museum in my hometown of Syracuse the University of Arts in Philadelphia, the Pacific Northwest College of Art in Portland, Oregon, and the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Recent exhibitions include a solo installation at Mattituck Museum and at Art Space, both in Connecticut, at Home Gallery in Slovakia and behind the curtain at Axiom Gallery in Boston, and most recently at the Berman Museum of Art here at Ursinus College. She is a 2003 recipient of a Massachusetts Cultural Council grant. Welcome, Allison. And Carrie Freno is Associate Professor of Sculpture and Drawing at Ursinus College. She received a Master of Fine Arts from Virginia Commonwealth University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts at the University of Arts in Philadelphia. Her practice unites video, video installation, sculpture, ceramics, and drawing. Professor Frino's work has been featured at the gallery at Bowdoin College, the Gateway Film Center in Columbus, Ohio, CICA Museum in Gyeonggi-do, Korea, and closer to home at the Woodmere Art Museum, High Tide Gallery, Little Berlin, and the Albert Gallery at the Allen Lane Art Center. She recently returned from a pilgrimage to the International Boxing Hall of Fame, also near my childhood home in Syracuse, New York. Please join me in welcoming my guests and please no pressure to talk about Syracuse. Welcome Allison Stafford and Carrie Freena. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm gonna show some images um, of the piece for those of you who haven't had a chance to see it. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the, the content yet because I think we'll get into that. Um, through our conversation. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of background to the piece. There was a comet, P67, which I have become very enamored with. And the very first time I heard of it, I heard this sound. I hope it comes through okay. Um, it's best if it's quiet where you are. So hopefully you can hear that a little bit. Um, I call that the comets chirping. Um, I forget exactly what it is, but they, they were able to land a lander on it. And that was the sound that came back from it. Although I know it was altered so it could be heard by the human ear. And this was uh, an exhibit, which actually when I started the show in Slovakia, I went to Vienna, which is really close by and went to the Art History Museum. And when I went there across the quad is the Natural History Museum. And they had a giant banner of a show on P67. So there I am with a um, little model of the P67, which filled up the whole room, but is much smaller than the, the, the actual comet. Okay, so this is um, the piece on exhibition at a gallery called At Home Gallery in Chamorin, 
Slovakia, which is about 20 minutes outside of Bratislava, about an hour away from Vienna. Um, and it's a former synagogue that um, this couple has lovingly restored more on the outside than the inside. They wanted to sort of respect the history of what's happened to the space on the inside. Um, and they use it as a place to show work, primarily installation work that somehow uses um, the space in a thoughtful way. So this is my piece uh, for that. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the mechanics of it. So up above the arc, and I could be wrong, is um, the projection of the P67 comment. And there's a video I got from online that sort of repeats over and over again. If you got to see the show at the Berman, it's the same video. Um, it's from the European Space Agency online. And then there were these mats, 12 little mats, and you could lay down on the mats and sort of watch the comet go by. Um, and when you put your head on the pillow, the sound emitted from the pillow, there were two little speakers underneath, so it would turn on as you laid your head down. And then these are small reproductions of the comet, and they rotated as you turned your head down, too. There was a mechanism there. So this was a little schoolboy who came in, and his, to me, his expression was everything, sort of just how he was able to, to go to another place and see the comet almost as the real thing or as, as this important thing worth watching and not just a 3D print of a comet. So this is um, the Berman show. And when you walk in, this is a vitrine, a really nice vitrine. And Deborah suggested putting these pieces in. And we'll talk more about these pieces later too. But they're these strange little felted, um, what I lovingly call my mouth plugs. They are designed to go in the mouth. You can see sort of they each have a little sort of lumpy end. And here's an example of me modeling um, one. That was the first, I think it was the first, it was the second one I made. And then this, when you turn around and go into the other room, this is what you'll see. There's two rocking chairs and two oval um, sort of bubble forms with videos projected on them. On the left is a video from the Rosetta lander um, that landed on P67. And as it traveled through space, basically stuff is flying all around, flying off of the comet, off of the surface of the comet and it ends up looking like snow. And then the right hand video is actual a snow squall, not in Syracuse, but in Rochester, New York, not too far away. And then there's these two rocking chairs that you're invited to sit in. Here's a little, you can see the dimension of the video screens. And then when you're sitting in one rocking chair, you're seeing P67 comet sort of rotating over and over again. And there's a mechanism in the chair that, um, I forget the kind of speaker, but it's the kind of speaker that makes it sound like the sound is right inside your head comes on. So you can hear it in the background, but you can also hear it much closer. So it becomes a very personal experience, I hope. And then this is the other chair and this has this image. I call it my coal image. It's not coal, but it's, there's sort of like the outer space, the, the up above side and the down below side. And the idea of coal is the down below side. And we can talk about that more later. And this also has the sound associated with it. A friend of mine in Slovakia is a blues musician, but also um, does chants that are really kind of incredible. And so he did the sound for this piece. I wanted more of a vocal human sound. And then this is a little video Video that just does a 360 of the gallery. It's not the greatest quality, it's just an iPhone video, but it'll give you a little bit of a sense of the space if you haven't been there. And you can hear faintly the little sounds. And the sounds are coming out of those 3D printed um, forms on the wall. And then down the hall, is this is where the vitrine is. So yeah, I just wanted people to have a feeling for what the experience was like when you went into the gallery. So hopefully that gives you a little feel. Yeah. And I feel like it's, if you haven't been in the gallery, it's, it's almost kind of impossible to understand the feeling unless you've been in it because there's so many layers of sensory things happening. We sort of talked about that the other day too. The, one of the things that struck me, I almost interjected when you were just describing, was the two sort of bumped out um, projections. The video of the weather on the, um, what is it? Meteor? Oh, um, on the comment. On the yeah. comment. It almost looks like like animation from the 1920s, like the quality of like it looks like some sort of strange stop motion. 
like it's really familiar in that way. Like it reminded me of these weird, like, I don't know, like videos that I'd get when I was little of like videos from the 1920s, like animation stuff. I don't know, I connected with that immediately. Like when I walked in, you're just sort of like immersed in these strange sounds that are sort of happening. And we also talked about how like you connect to these sounds regardless of whether you know a language or language because they're primal sounds, like the, the clicking of this comet and the deep chanting of that is sort of coming from the, are the, those are models of the comet or are they clouds? Those um, are actually little coal coal heaps. Um, they look very cloud like, you know, putting them on the wall. But I didn't yeah. find that. Um, you know, I thought of the color when I printed them, and I thought of them very much as little ghosts of the mountain. It's really yeah. strange, but they, yeah, they definitely do look like clouds, and I don't mind that because it sort of fits into that narrative of above and below. And then I just know, like, when I brought um, a class of students in there, they were just you know, like delighted and and surprised, but also like struck by the way you've engineered the technology to work with the rocking chairs. So like them by moving their body. And I don't know if that was made clear by the way Allison just described, but as you rock in these rocking chairs, the sound, not only it's, I think someone pointed out their hyperdirectional speakers or something in the chat. The sound not only like ends up sort of in your head, but it also sort of relates to how quickly you're rocking or how slowly you're rocking. Mm. But that's what it feels like. It's just, it's, it's incredible because I feel like if you take sort of like an initial scan of the room, there are like, there are like certain elements, but once you're really in there, there's so many layers, the way the things work together. Um, it creates a really, it just, it creates an experience. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I sort of, it was sort of had more elements going on than the piece in Slovakia. Um, you know, initially I was thinking of sort of bringing that piece uh, to the Berman, but it, it didn't quite work out for several reasons, including COVID. Plus it's just a different space. Um, I was going to say too, it's interesting because the Slovakia piece, it seemed like that space was very full of light in a way. They have and amazing light there. The, yeah. The berm in that space is um, dark. Yeah. So the this it's great for video installation and it's really awesome in the way that you can kind of be completely enveloped in a in a video, but it, it's so it, it's really like two totally different versions of of the work yeah you know it's, it's sort of once I realized I couldn't do the same thing and that I nor should I do the same thing um I just tried to be a little more responsive to this space and it's sort of a strange space um you know and, and I had the maps and everything once once you got there it definitely was like oh okay this is this is what um Jabra meant by the form of the space but one thing i really loved is the duality of it you know there were there were two very clear sides and the idea of trying to make those two sides have different um experiences but also work together was really interesting for me well that makes sense because it something you mentioned the other day and also just sort of reading your statement online and looking at some of your other work like you're really interested in the space between the space between yeah. like two you know sort of polar opposites that exist so in this installation it's putting it really simply down low and up high and yeah, yeah. um but and also like with the mouth plugs the way you were talking about them was there this sort of manifestation of what that that physical thing is that's between like the outside and the inside like your inner self your inner world and your outer experience and how you perceive perceive things oh but I was yeah I was wondering like in that context how did you when you went to the museum that was across the quad that was like the history museum is that's not the first time you saw the model of I wrote it down p67 you had already known about this and how did why were you interested why did you get interested in space or this comet because that's like, it's not like the rest of your work is about space. No, it happened from a couple different um, directions so, and everything really fit together really strangely, ridiculously well. Part of it is that the gallery, the Slovakia gallery 
is on a street, I don't know how to say it properly, but it's like Mlyachanska, um, which apparently means Milky Way because that's where the cows were. But this, the it's hard. It's a strange little town. They have this water tower that looks like a UFO. So for me, I always thought like, you know, it's no, it's the Milky Way. It's outer space right here in this tiny town in Slovakia. So I sort of you know, wanted to do something with that. And then this specific comment, um, that sound really was the, the impetus for me. Um, I just found it fascinating. I like the idea that whether or not we can hear it, those sounds are happening. You know, it's sort of like that joke if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? Well, yeah, it does. Um, and that sort of makes me think we're less important than we want to be in a really wonderful way. You know, life goes on without us. But also just the quality of the sound itself was really interesting to me. And I, I remember as soon as I heard it, I sent it to my friend Chaba, who runs that space. And I was like, I don't know how, but this is part of the next the next piece. So the more I read about um, the comment and the more I learned about it, the more I was like, oh my God, like this is such this amazing thing. It has a lot of things about twos or dualities about it. There were two, two people who worked together to discover it, which is no, you know, huge thing because that's sort of how science works. A lot of time it's a collaborative experience, but also they, they say that shape, do I have a, I have a little orange, <laughs> the shape of it which sometimes they refer to as looking like a rubber duck. There's all sorts of pictures of it as a rubber duck, but it's a really strange shape for a comet. And they um, hypothesize that basically two comets ran into each other in space and stuck together. And that's why it's this shape. And I love that. I mean, again, it's like, it's like the comet making sounds. It's like this weird metaphorical, like, oh, they just decided to hang out together and become one. Not to read too much into it, but it's sort of this lovely idea. And then I was also looking up, I was really interested in the idea of cycles and things coming back, not necessarily repeating, but sort of revisiting things. I think I had a quote in the, in the gallery, in the artist statement, things come together, things go apart, repeat. So the idea that it's the cycle that just sort of happens over and over again. And when I looked at the, the cycle of the comet, its cycle was something like 6.25 years. And that was really close to how long since I'd been at the gallery, because I'd shown there before. It was like within a month of when I was there. Ooh, that's so it was weird. very weird. And then seeing the exhibition in Vienna, it was just like, sort of all these weird things coming together in a really lovely way. Yeah, that's, I was just thinking too, part of like your statement that you have on your website, one of the things that you talk about exploring is this idea of unmet longing. And I was thinking about that too, in this context, how just these, these sort of polar opposites, the, the comet in the sky and the coal in the mountain, like will never, like though they are to some extent made of the same yeah. Thing. they're like never never the two shall meet sort of thing and it's yeah. really interesting the comet I didn't realize I the comet I'd never seen anything like that I didn't realize comets could look like that yeah um, I don't know if too many do I think it's like so weird to hear that story that they just smashed into each other yeah, they hypothesize they <laughs> there are a couple other hypotheses hypotheses but this mm -hmm. is what I'm sticking with because if it's my narrative <laughs> yeah no that makes sense that's so wild. So what also you, you've done all of these things in that location of the planet. It seems like you're really sort of attracted to that, that area, like sort of like Eastern European countries and like, what, how did you kind of get into that? No, I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I do, it's something I think about a lot. Um, and actually it's something I was going to comment on with your art is even my friends from Slovakia have said, they're like, you're like a Czech artist. And I'm like, I have no idea why, because I don't like, I, I'm not Czech. I don't, I haven't lived, you know, I visited there for, I had a residency for like a month. I don't know what it so is. What does that mean? Well, they, and we were talking about it, and I think there's a certain amount of a love for the ridiculousness mm. um, that mm -hmm. happens in a lot of Eastern European art. And I think a lot of it was basically a form of subversion to talk about things that you weren't allowed to talk about. And also, I think it's probably just the, a little bit their sensibility. But I think, I mean, and the mouthpieces are very ridiculous um, yes. to me, and I like that they're ridiculous. 
you know, I have to, I have to think more about why it is. I love it. I mean, sure. It's another way to say something without coming right, right out and say it. It's a way to deliver a message and have it be, you know, humor is a great way to sort of open up doors and, and get your ideas out there. And then hopefully it's got enough to it that they keep thinking about it later. Right. It's sort of, it's a hook in a way. It's, it's also like a way to kind of like understand yourself in relation to the world in the yeah. same way you were thinking you were talking about earlier where it's like we kind of don't matter in a beautiful yeah. way yeah and and I, I love that idea I love that feeling because I don't want to matter so much you know when yeah. it's so big and important it's it's like is it really that important right the reality is that like it's it's not <laughs> yeah. yeah and the comet doesn't care <laughs> Comment right. doesn't care if I'm stuck in traffic. No, it's going to keep clicking. It's just going to be <laughs> clicking. Yeah. But wait, so you did, like, how did you even get introduced to that sort of culture and area and artists? Like, we, you did a residency? Is that how you sort of first came? Oh, in? Yeah, I, I met, well, Pittsburgh is very Slovak. Okay. Eastern European. So there's like a, that's where I went to is undergraduate is school. Is that where you were originally from? No, no, sort of from here and there, um, okay. but it's where I think of it as like my art origin, you okay. know, it's where I was sort of an art baby and sort of taking it all in and taking in this new town and this new, um, but it's very, very much part of the culture there um, in, in a huge way. And I loved it. I thought it was really fascinating um, for me because I just, I, you know, it was all Eastern European cultures were fairly new to me. I, I actually being part of a city I'm sorry go ahead yeah no I just I cut you off but it was just making me think this summer we spent a night in Pittsburgh and we went to the Smithsonian mostly to bring my son to see the Mr. Rogers they have like the how the original set of like oh, yeah. the land <laughs> leave. they have a pretty weird wax Mr. Rogers which it's was like, a little creepy yeah it was like not super fan of, but there's yeah. an incredible yeah. like historical artifacts of like all of these different it was just like a melting pot of all of these cultures from like the late 1800s through like the 50s and 60s and they just had all of these it was like cultural religious artifacts like pots and pans that different people cooked in from different like you know like I Italian to, to it was it was amazing it was such yeah. a cool museum there's an aesthetic and one of my favorite things used to be walking through a part of town called the South Side, which was very Slovak. It was sort of really close to where the steel mills were and looking at people's tchotchka in the windows. And they just always had like, you know, little porcelain birds or little like, I don't know, just like weird tchotchka depending on the people. And when I went to Slovakia, I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> it was a similar thing. Yeah, yeah. Especially their cemeteries had tons, of, like the graves had tons of tchotchke on it. And I was like, oh, it's this, it's this thing. It's this way of remembering, you know, I'm sure it ties into Catholicism a little bit because, you know, objects and meaning. And But yeah, I remember being like, oh yeah, <laughs> it all makes sense now. I mean, for probably like 10 or 15 years, I lived in South Philly, which was prim primarily like Italian American and the, uh, or, and I guess Irish American too, parts of it. Um, but same thing with like the windows and the row houses, like there was just, it was bizarro and yeah. it would change with the seasons, but like. Yeah, and that's like a liminal space too, right? Like it's sort of like where you present this little piece of yourself that's important to the outside world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Between the public street and the private residence. And yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, and there's there's just like a lot of Eastern European art and literature that I was somewhat immersed in, and I still I still love it. Um, it's a beautiful Slovakia is a ridiculously beautiful country. I've seen very little of it, but it's very beautiful. I've never been. I would highly recommend it. Okay. Although Bratislava is really boring. My my the wife of um Chaba, she's Canadian. And I said, do you think a day will be enough to see Bratislava? And she just looked at me and she's like, it might be too much. <laughs> and I was like, really? And then I got there, I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so good bookstores. Well, okay, Unmet Longing. You were talking about Unmet Longing, Space Between. Another thing I'm thinking about that we were talking about last, 
a couple of days ago was the sort of tactility of video. That's really interesting about your work too. As I looked at more of your work as well, like just online, there's this clear fascination with materials in process. Like your final product of things is, it seems like a lot about process and like even sort of like showing maybe process or like touch a little bit in some things. I'm thinking about like the hands. On, um, then video is, we were talking about how that digital media can sometimes feel really cold in that way, like not connected to process, to material process in the same way. But, and I was wondering if you, you shared some thoughts last time that I thought were really interesting. I was wondering if you could speak about that a little bit. Because I yeah. it's like you've combined so much in like it, it's not typical, I think, to find an artist who's using like, you know, felt and beading in this like really um, careful, particular way, creating these really like strange things. And then there's also these like beautiful video installations and there's like this incredible technology that you interact with. And there's so many layers and facets to this. Like, how do you bring all that together? Oh my God, with a lot of help for one. <laughs> for one. Um, I mean, I definitely love materials. I joke with, with when I have certain students who I can see have like a way with materials. And for some reason, it's mostly female identified students. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like, oh, material girl, material girl. <laughs> there's like just a certain way of learning. You know, it's there was one student last mod who was just like so fun to watch because you could see um, something I, I believe very much. And I feel like to the point of like, I know it, it's just a fact is that you can learn by manipulating things. You can learn from the materials. Um, and to watch these, these two kids in my class sort of working, it's like, you knew what they were, you didn't know exactly what they were thinking, but you could see them thinking. And it was, it's just like a really beautiful thing to watch for me. For me, I always think, I think what I always say is like, it starts with the idea and what I want it to do. And then whatever I need to pull in material wise, but that sort of leaves me sometimes I get frustrated. Cause I'm like, you know, Jack of what is it? Not Jack of all trades. Is that Jack of all trades? Yeah. Past yeah. Is that the same? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I sometimes see these people who just work with one material and like, just do so so much with that one material where I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just stick to felt and never do anything else. But then it's like, hmm, but that image and that sound and that, you know, all, all the materials are interesting to me. You know, when I did that residency in Den Boss, it was ceramic. And I kind of, I had a hate for ceramics from going to Alfred. I was just sort of like. I was going to no. ask you, I didn't, I didn't realize you had gone to, to Alfred, but you said that you covered. Were, yeah. I, well, I went to Alfred. I did like a summer program there at some point in undergrad for ceramics. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely like spent some ceramic time at Alfred. There was that, was that weird, what was that weird? Oh, Pollywog Holler. Was that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever been there, but I know everybody else, like all the cool kids went there. It's, it's oh, enough a place where there's like a sauna and stuff. Oh God, I don't, there's like, yeah, there was like a, there was a huge, there was a teepee. There were beavers. Yep. I saw beavers there. There's like a weird yep. log cabin. They do like, it's like, a, it's a lot, um, very hippie. It's very, yep. there's like all this like sculpture installed in the woods. I mean, it was very cool to go see. Um, it's a strange was enough, Once was enough for me. And the pizza yeah. was good, but yeah. It's a strange, strange little town. So yeah, that, that sort of the intensity and the purest um, philosophy around ceramics at Alfred drove me mental because I don't, you know, for me, I'm like, you do whatever works. And I remember suggesting to another grad student, it was like, there's this material that's plaster and paper pulp and you can knock them out much faster. And oh my God, like the professors <laughs> were just like, but that doesn't have the history of clay. And I was like, and clay doesn't have the history of plaster. That's how it works. But if you want to get it faster, right. um, yeah, you know, I just, I, I love learning new materials. I think with them, you know, I talk to my kids all the time. Um, my kids being my students about learning, um, can come from the materials, ideas can come from the materials. And that's very much what my drawings are, which weren't in the show, but my mouthpieces are. Um, I feel like as I'm making one, I have an idea for the next one and the next one and the next one. And it's inspired by things I see or things I'm thinking, but also it's inspired by the material just as much. So yeah, I feel, I mean, I, I totally agree. I, I feel like working with materials, you learn, 
you learn so much about like the world's around, like you learn about your own body in some way. Like you just oh, learn how things exist and how they're made and how, like what different influences can like do to them. And it is, it's almost like unending. Like, it's like the more you work it with is. Yeah. the And the process is too, you know, one of the, one of the things about um, the needle felting came very much from the stress and, and um, anxiety from the pandemic. Right. Stemming some cloth, a soft little shape of the needle over and over again, thousands of times is really therapeutic. I had a lot of Zoom faculty meetings and that was my way of keeping focus and not, you know, it was a strange time and no one wanted to be on Zoom. We didn't want to sit there and, and stare at the screen any more than we had to. Right. Um, so that became very therapeutic. And then it sort of came to this other level of, of oh, the material does this thing that no other material I've worked with does. Um, I love the fact that it's wool um, because it's not bad for the, well, I don't know about the wool industry, but it's not a permanent object. And I love that. Yeah, about it's like it. a pure organic material. It's yeah. not processed in any way, except by you stabbing it. And it's very, it's very fun to stab and it'll do what I want it to do. So as long as I can keep the moths away from it, I'm good. Oh, right. Do you have yeah. a lot of moth balls around? I don't, I Those don't. Kind of Lavender weird. and, um, no, oh, that's good. Peter and Ziploc bags. Oh so. yeah. Good, good. <laughs> My grandma's house smelled like moth balls. Oh, yeah. I can't I think do they're that. they're toxic. They are. They yeah. are. Whenever really I tell them, I think of grandma. So <laughs> I kind of have this weird relationship with them. Well, materials and smells and, and sounds all have those memory aspects too. Um, yeah. Well, we can turn to questions and answers. If um, anyone has questions, you can either unmute yourself and ask, or you can type them into the chat and I can read them. Are there any questions? Oh, I just remembered what my question was. Can I ask it? Carrie, you can ask when, a question. When was the, when was the, when like, I don't know if you mentioned this, but when did the comet get sort of documented or when was that video from? I think it was, when, I want to say 2013. Okay. I have my, I have my book from the exhibition, but it's in oh, German, so. I was just curious. I feel like it's 20, yeah, I feel like it's around 2013. Um, and it was the first time they were able to land, you know, um, a lander, whatever, yeah. a way to get information off, like right on. And there's actually some really interesting um, video that I saw at some late night thing on PBS about how they got the lander to land because it's very sandy. So it has to grip into the soil. Um, I think it was around 2013, maybe 2015. And when did you first hear about it? Was It, it was in the news right around then. Okay. Um, so so pretty, pretty much as it was happening, I was paying attention. Got it. Because I was just thinking kind of like bringing it full circle. I mean, I guess this had kind of been like percolating in your brain for a while, but then talking about being on Zoom meetings and the pandemic and like this idea of being isolated. And that's like another thing that comes like there's this really deep feeling that can be accessed in your installation of sort of like um, smallness, almost like what we were talking about, right, which could kind of relate to isolation. And just thinking about making art in the pandemic, I was just kind of um, wondering what the timing of the, the comment was. Yeah, I mean, I think the idea is sort of related. I think that idea of smallness is part of why I love that picture of that little boy, um, because he yeah. just, it seemed like he lost himself pretty quickly and intensely. Um, and it turned out to be this very meditative piece. It wasn't until after it was in the gallery and I laid underneath it and I was like, this is really nice. And I was like, oh, I made a meditation room for myself. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would love questions. Any questions you have? I have a question, Allison. It was funny to hear you say like, oh, I wish I, sometimes I wish I would just work with one medium, but I hope you don't because I feel like the, like one of my favorite things about your art is like your focus on senses and how you use all these different materials to sort of evoke different senses, whether it's 
you know, a beautiful object or movement or video or sound or all those things together. But sometimes like just the suggestion of things that are so um, moving for me, like I'm remembering a show that you did where there were um, like negative space of a tongue, like where no. you cast a tongue and it was like, you know, visual, nothing's moving, no sound, but everybody there wanted to stick their tongue into those things. <laughs> the same with the mouthpieces. I'm sure everyone that comes in is like, I really, really want to put that in my mouth, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and just other, you know, there was many things I can think of where you have motorized thing where the sound really like is such a important part of it, even though on the face of it, many would be like, oh, it's a visual thing where these things are moving across, but it's not. So can you talk just a little bit about just senses, like what that, wow. how that is with your work? What, what? Wow. I mean, that's a big question. I'm sorry. No, I know. There's something about it. <laughs> Questions are good. I think a lot of it has to do with the idea of longing um, that Carrie was talking about before, like the tongues, what the tongues were, were these little plaster boxes with the negative space of a tongue cast inside of it. And then there were um, silver leaves. So there were these little silver spaces and you really, and I love the idea of giving a person that feeling of sort of like wanting to do something and not being able to, because I feel like that's so much of life. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of involving the viewer as an intimate or necessary part of the installation. It's funny because I was trying to think of like what kind of art doesn't do that. And I think even, you know, I just saw a nice exhibition of Albert Pinkham Ryder um, down in Fall River, New Bedford. I always get those towns mixed up wherever the Whaling Museum is. Um, and that actually is a very visceral feeling too, where I feel like I'm sucked into it. But I, yeah, I do want to feel like I'm sucked into it. And I want it to leave me with an idea that I can hold on to for a while you know there's nothing better to me than thinking about a piece I saw 10 years ago and and figuring something else out or seeing how it relates to something I'm thinking about or relates to something I'm experiencing yeah the senses are are important to me I don't know I don't know if I've thought about it that much touch was a big one and I was reading about touch for a while um, other than it's a way to sort of share an experience with someone if that makes sense, I hope that makes sense. It does. I love just the suggestion of something else, even with the felting, like the texture there is so beautiful. Carrie yesterday you... was asking, like, do you actually want to put these in your <laughs> And I do, you know, because I take those funny photographs and it doesn't bother me, although it's something I wouldn't want to do for a long time, but it's also sort of strange. It's more almost like not the texture, but like the, the shape um, it distorts your mouth into. Some of them can be really uncomfortable. The green one, the last one I showed was really big and it was sort of like a jawbreaker. Um, and I like that idea of like, you know, making your face do these ridiculous things. So I'm thinking about the um, uniqueness of each of those felted forms. And then I'm also thinking about the little anthracite coal mountain cast speakers that were mounted on the wall. And uh, being more familiar with your work, you do um, tend to sometimes do a lot of cast multiples. So there's yeah. this dichotomy between the cast multiples and the uniqueness of your other forms. And I'm wondering if you can talk about talk about that or how you see those things working together. Yeah, I guess I hadn't thought of that, but in a weird way, the, um, the mouth plugs, you know, I didn't make just one. I probably have close to 20 by now and I can see, keep making them and keep making them. So they're not identical, obviously like the cast elements. Um, you know, a lot of how I've thought about the cast elements that are the same. So things like the little mountain clouds that are on the wall or, um, like Anne was talking about the piece with the tongues. A lot of the multiples I want, basically because there'll be ideally multiple viewers. Is that now the second time besides the comment where I've had a, now the third time I'm lying, um, I've had a 3D printed form in an exhibition. And it's kind of funny because I sort of thought that's something I would never do. But the more I taught it, the more I taught it, the more I was like, oh, you can do this thing. And this, the idea of, um, the being able to get the they're called stl files that you 3d print from that was from um 
the European Space Agency. So the idea of like being able to get that direct information and recreate this thing that no one could touch, you know, so, and I made a whole bunch of little ones so people could carry them around in your pocket. Cause I like the idea of having your own little personal comet that you could take with you. Um, I know that digressed a little bit, but um, does that make sense? I've got one of the little pocket. Oh, do you? You got a white one. You don't have a fluorescent orange. Like yeah. This was just in the printer at the time. And it does look like a duck a little, doesn't it? It does. It does. I I, I brought my daughters to the exhibition um, and they love these things. And my younger one wanted to make sure I asked about this and how you made that. She ah. doesn't have to be printed, but yeah, I, I didn't know like how you got the design for it and all that. Yeah, and that's one of the wonderful things about the European Space Agency and NASA is the same, where basically when they have images or information like that, they just put it on their website and they're like, go for it, like do whatever you want with it. So um, in my video class, I have students uh, use found footage and they can use NASA's because it's copyright free, NASA doesn't care. And the European Space Agency is the same way with, you know, I'm sure if it's it's something that needs to be kept private they they don't share it um but yeah you know it is that idea of sort of like being able to touch this thing that we can't touch 3d printed uh flash forge printer pla <laughs> so we have a so, question in the chat um is it hard for you to create for yourself on your own time when you're not working for an upcoming installation mm -hmm. It can be really hard. It can be really hard. I'm on my mod off right now. So I teach um, at a school that has mod systems. So they have six, six week sessions instead of semesters. And it can be quite intense and hard to create. Um, so when I have my mod off is sort of my creative time. That's why I clean my studio because it's sort of like my palate cleansing for, for starting to work. It can be hard and it can't be hard. Um, I think I just use it in a different way. I think the hands-on, I do need um, sort of uninterrupted time for, to a degree. But also like I'm thinking about these things all the time, you know, I'm thinking about what I want to do for, you know, a, a new installation at that place in Slovakia or something I've read and how can I turn it into an idea or hearing, you know, the comet noises um, and being like, I have to do something with that. So you're always taking in all the time. Um, and that's actually one of the things I do love about teaching is like, you're always talking about it. And so your brain sort of always in this like jello of ideas about art and, and the students and my colleagues do feed me, you know, they are intellectually having some really good questions. Um, but yeah, the hands-on time. Yeah. So if it is, it is harder, but you also find ways. I started doing these small little drawings which are, there's some, the blue and black, and then those brown, those are all little drawings in my laundry too. And part of the reason I started doing the small drawing, well, there's a number of reasons why I started doing the small drawings, but one of the things I like about doing the small drawings is I can like knock out 10 in an evening. I draw them and then I, I paint them in later. But trying to think of small things I can do. And that's also where the needle felting happened. Um, I started making those sweaters of which Soph is an owner. Um, of one. Um, but then it's sort of the more I got to know the material and there's this prompt that they also partially started with this prompt from a Dutch jeweler named Ruth Peters. And he also loves teaching along with making is very much part of his um, passion for lack of a better word. Um, and he, at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was freaking out. And he was like, okay, I'm going to give you guys all some assignments. So on Instagram, he would give a different assignment every day. And one of the first ones was put something, make a sculpture that fits in your mouth. So that's sort of what started this. And then I kept saying, well, no, I can do that better. I have a different idea. And it just kind of kept growing from there. So yeah, you know, the prompts could be fun, fascinating little things. And I give them as a teacher and, and it sort of was nice to put myself in the student mode for that because it was, as you all know, a very strange time. Our integrating ideas from science and art and literature and family history. Um, mm -hmm. Do you find that 
much of your work is calling from and drawing from all these this kind of multiplicity of sources yeah I think so and I think a lot of it's sort of fine, trying to figure out how I fit in the world um, which I think we're all trying to figure out so it's sort of, you know, the personal, there's always this very personal level to my work that it's sort of hard for me. It takes like a year or two for me to be able to see it from the outside a little bit, but trying to figure out different things. The coal mine imagery, I do genealogy a lot. And I found out my great grandfather, who was the first one to come to this country from that part of the family, actually from Lithuania, um, but German ethnically. He, a lot of his family came over at the same time and they mostly were in Connecticut in the brass mills or a lot of them went to the coal mines and a sister of his was married to a man who who died in a coal mine accident and my mother had told me that story and she knew about it so I looked into it a little more and so the idea of sort of like the earth and the body and where they come together and where they separate was sort of the more out there idea um but also the idea of like this guy trying to get a better life for his family and dying for it was also incredibly hard and powerful. And, and you know, I, I tend to be a little bit of an anti-capitalist and thinking how people, the song John Henry did it for me when I was a kid, um, but thinking it did, it totally did. I swear to God, it turned me into a little lefty. Um, I was like, it's so unfair. But, you know, so that story sort of was like this family folklore to me, um, but then also tied into the ideas of cycles and things coming back in the earth and how humans relate to being on the earth. And even if it's not there, is it still there and all these things. But yeah, you know, I, whatever excites me, my parents were both scientists. Um, so it's not unusual for me to find science interesting. But sort of I'm looking for like the story in it or the little, the question in it, the philosophy of it. Um, but yeah, literature, because so often I see these things and I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I just can't say it. And it might happen in literature and it might happen in science and it might happen in a sound. So music or, or literally just a sound. So I wanted to read another question from the chat. Uh, and it is about the relationship that, um, you see or see anew of the mouth plug pieces to the comet installation? Um, and is there a connection that you can share? Um, if these are separate bodies of work, I'm wondering if you found an unexpected dialogue between them now that they are across from one another at the Berman show. Yeah, I would say I definitely saw a dialogue. Um between them. And I think even from, from talking um, with Deborah and Carrie, I was sort of things were making sense to me. Deborah had this, you had this great sentence when you were writing the text about imagining me in the rocking chair and just this comet flying down from space sort of into my mouth. Wasn't that, you had a sentence similar to, and it was so funny. It's like, that's so weird. And it's really right. And I don't know why, you know, a lot of the mouthpieces are sort of about manifestations. You know, when we, when we say things, when we think things, when we interact with things, like how do they become this tangible, um, strange little shape? Um, Deborah thought of them a little bit. You were talking about like sort of thought are speech bubbles like they have in comics and things and yeah I would say that's that's part of it um there's this great word which I still can't find I was I was talking to um Deborah and Carrie about it the other night and the definition of it is the direction of an utterance and the idea of like when you say something where does it go what happens to it and I'm actually really sort of interested in that quite a bit my next the next piece I'm thinking about is very much about um where do thoughts go and where do words that tie into thoughts go when you're done with them I don't know if that makes does that make sense Tom I don't, I don't know if it really addresses it. I sort of went off on a tangent, but yeah, originally I was kind of like, mm, how do they relate? I don't really, like, I know they both came from me, but sometimes I just do what I do and then figure it out later. And I think I'm just starting to figure it out a little bit. There's something about them that I was, um, I mentioned to Allison when we were installing the exhibition and especially seeing them on these, um, these little structures underneath a glass vitrine um, that they 
are so unique looking and so organic looking. And at the same time, they look like these precious little archeological relics. And they remind me of some of the really fine jewelry work that um, is in an exhibition at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology um, that are, are the treasures from the royal tombs of Ur that are these ancient um, gold and lapis lazuli and garnet and all of these very, very intricate jewelry and headdresses uh, that look so contemporary in some ways and so ancient in other ways. And there is something, even though they're wool and bead, there's something about them that looks really, really precious to me. Yeah, they definitely come out of that jewelry history. Um, and we were talking about the other day, sort of like artistically how I developed. And I, I think at Carnegie Mellon, the at undergraduate, the class that sort of meant the most to me was working with Carol Kamada. And it was jewelry, but also small metals, but also sculpture, because she was sort of getting larger and larger and larger at the time. And we talked a lot about sort of crossing these boundaries and craft versus art, which, you know, is this to me very relevant thing, although it has a big history um, and can be quite problematic. But yeah, you know, and, and it's the most in some ways is very intimate because it's always relating to the body. And I think that's something that I, I take with me to all my work. Like, how do you make this relate to the body? How does it have to do with the physicality of it? And I, you know, and I had fun with the ornamentation of it, with the little beadworks. I started it and I was like, this is too cheesy. And then I was like, oh, maybe, maybe that's okay. Maybe we need a little bit of cheesy. And I just, I ended up really, I mean, that totally ties into jewelry for sure. And that sort of ornamentation. And it's also a way for the forms to sort of continue, you know, like this is one and it has all these little um, beads coming off of it. And it's like, just being this static ring wasn't enough. It has to kind of keep exploding and keep going. Um, and it's this little way for it to have this little utterance where and directionality from itself. I want to ask if there are any more questions or thoughts that people would like to share? I wanted to ask Allison, I mean, I guess you talked about the thoughts, the, the speech bubble or the thoughts, but I was just gonna ask how you're gonna use your next creative period, which is your mod off. Which is now. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more about that idea and I'll be talking with Alan who is here, who's sort of my, my tech guru, who helps me do things that I don't know how to do. Um, he did a lot of the technology for the, the Berman show and the Slovakia show. And I want to work with trumpets and sort of finding a way to get them to speak, if that makes sense. Well, no, that doesn't make any sense because they don't speak, but um, getting trumpet forms and I want to connect them to um, a foot pedal, a, a bellows, so that when you pump the foot pedal, little sounds come out of it. And I've had a couple ideas about that. Um, so yeah, I'm very interested in, in sort of where do thoughts go? Where do ideas go? Um, the Lori Anderson lectures that I mentioned the other night that I've been watching quite a bit, which are amazing, if anybody else gets a chance. She talked about when, when people die and encyclopedia dies with them, the idea that it being their knowledge. Um, and I remember literally when my father died, one of the first things I said to my mom is where did his thoughts go because he was such a cerebral person he would he lived very much in his head he was a physicist and um so i love that idea of sort of what happens to these things when the when the tangible root object is gone like what happens to all these other less tangible parts that's exciting yeah we'll we'll see my friend's son too at thanksgiving um He's studying sound tech at Georgia Tech. And I was like, hey, Eli, I want to do this thing. How do we do it? And he's like, okay, you have like, he, he had me using like 20 Arduinos. And I'm like, okay, we'll see. So. And for joining us this evening, uh, the last of our public events of this season. And thank you, Allison, so much for being so generous with your time and for sharing your work with us. We've just enjoyed reveling in it all summer and all fall. And um, now that it's it's down, it's deinstalled as of today, I definitely already miss 
the background chanting and clicking that I used to be able to hear from my office. Um, so I may, I may crazy. Now I may ask you for a little recording of that. Oh, I can do that. Um, awesome. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming, all for joining us. The Berman Museum is currently undergoing a change of exhibitions and will reopen in mid-January with our exhibition, Mini Me, which recently opened, maquettes from the permanent collection, and also three new exhibitions, William Earl Williams, a stirring song sung heroic, African Americans from slavery to freedom and 1619 to 1865. We'll also be opening an exhibition of paintings by Carrie Mae Smith entitled Lost and Found, Conversations with the Berman Museum of Arts, Pennsylvania German Collection, and a site-specific installation in our Pfeiffer Wing by the artist Bahar Bebahani, and that exhibition is called Immigrant Flora. So please come back and join us next season, and we will have a lot of public programming, both in person and remotely on Zoom to go along with those new exhibitions. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming and for hosting. Thank you.